Greetings, Cosmic Core, and welcome back to the channel. If you are new here, welcome to our sci fi family. In this three part series, we're going to cover Battlestar Galactica from the original 1978 series to the rebooted 2004 series and beyond. Now, if you have never seen anything Battlestar Galactica, there are spoilers ahead. And we have just one request. If you like what you are seeing here, please be sure to like and share our video. And if you would like to support our channel even further, please be sure to subscribe. It's one click for you, but it means the world to us. Now, let's start part one and follow our ragtag fugitive fleet from their beginnings on the small screen in 1978 through today. In late 1977, Universal Television reportedly had a top-secret project in development for the 1978-1979 season called Galactica. Considered a small-screen version of Star Wars, it would feature special effects from John Dykstra, the man responsible for the special effects in Star Wars. When ABC announced its fall schedule in May of 1978, Battlestar Galactica had been given the 8 to 9 p.m. time slot on Sundays and aired on ABC on September 17, 1978. With each episode costing an extravagant $1 million compared to the $450,000 episodes of the time, there was some speculation that Battlestar Galactica would be a miniseries used by ABC to draw viewers to its schedule at the start of the new 1978-1979 season. But ABC declared Battlestar Galactica would be a weekly series. At its core of actors was Lauren Green, who starred as Commander Adama, leader of the ragtag fugitive fleet composed of the remnants of the 12 colonies of Cobol that were all but destroyed by a sneak attack by the evil Cylons. Richard Hatch and Dirk Benedict co-starred as Captain Apollo, who was portrayed as Adama's son, and Lieutenant Starbuck, a pair of ace Viper pilots. Other characters included Lieutenant Boomer, played by Herbert Jefferson Jr., and Athena, portrayed as Adama's daughter and played by Marna Jensen. And who could forget Lord Baltar, played to perfection by John Calicos, who had betrayed the Twelve Colonies of Man to the Cylon. As September approached, Battlestar Galactica was seen as a surefire hit. The Washington Post stated that the spectacular and refreshingly sci-fi fantasy will probably be the most watched news series on the air. Also, according to Newsweek, they had reported that ABC has designed what looked to be a smash hit for TV's fall lineup. However, in creating this smash hit, Battlestar Galactica's production schedule had gotten out of control as the last handful of episodes were being filmed. Shooting didn't wrap until 10 days before the episodes were scheduled to air, and more importantly, the editing process continued until the day prior to the broadcast. Donald Belisario, who was one of the producers, scriptwriter, and director of the original Battlestar Galactica series, held out hope that the network would give the series a second year. On the other side of the network fence, NBC president Fred Silverman suggested that if ABC renews that show, that will prove they are in real trouble. ABC had until mid-April to decide whether to invest more money in what seemed to be a losing proposition. But what gave Battlestar Galactica some hope was there was a real chance that one of the competing shows in the same time slot, All in the Family, would end its run in the 1978-1979 season, as Jean Stapleton, who played Edith Bunker, had announced she was leaving the series in January of 1979. With All in the Family out of the way, perhaps Battlestar Galactica could regain some of that lost potential. Unfortunately, 
Battlestar Galactica's ratings went from averaging over a 40 share to under a 30 share in less than two months. And its costs were no doubt more than enough for ABC to realize it was time to pack it in. The fact that All in the Family would be returning in the fall, but this time under the moniker of Archie Bunker's Place, was just one more reason for the network to end the series. And Battlestar Galactica was officially canceled on Monday, April 23rd, 1979. Cancellation should have been the end of Battlestar Galactica. However, Universal had plans to release a version of the three-hour premiere in theaters during the summer of 1979 in an effort to recoup some of its losses. But other than that, it was over for the survivors of the 12 colonies of Cobalt. But then, something happened. In May of 1979, Glenn A. Larson was approached by ABC to produce a two-hour Battlestar Galactica telefilm that would see the ragtag fleet finally find Earth. Now, all this was happening while ABC was anxiously awaiting the start of the 1979-80 season to see if the popular Mork and Mindy could take some of the wind out of Archie Bunker's sails. In place of Battlestar Galactica, ABC had moved Mork and Mindy to the 8 to 8.30 Sunday time slot opposite Archie Bunker's place on CBS. It was a rematch between two of the three superpower broadcast networks of the time. And this time, there was speculation that ABC would come out the winner. Hello? Hello? Anybody in there? <laughs> Little hatchling brothers, you must revolt against your oppressors. You have nothing to lose but your shells. <laughs> as much as I like Mindy, it's against intergalactic law to eat fellow space travelers. Fly, be free! <laughs> However, the speculation may have been a bit misplaced. Mork and Mindy could not take down Archie Bunker's place. Now, for fans of Battlestar Galactica, this was like Charlie finding the last golden ticket to take a tour of Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. The failure of Mork and Mindy to successfully take on Archie Bunker's place suggested to ABC that perhaps Battlestar Galactica should not have been canceled. I mean, if one of ABC's hit sitcoms of the time couldn't compete with an aging and revamped Archie Bunker, it may have been too much to expect that a new series, even one as heavily promoted as Battlestar Galactica, could overcome the Bunker Challenge. And there were those within ABC who felt the same way. Having already ordered a Battlestar Galactica telefilm back in May of 1979, there was speculation that ABC would use the ratings of the telefilm as a test to see if viewers would welcome a return of the series. However, only Lauren Green and Terry Carter, who played Colonel Ty from the original cast, returned for the telefilm, which was soon expanded to three hours and scheduled to air over three consecutive Sundays in early 1980. The telefilm was set decades after Battlestar Galactica, and this show would see the Galactica finally reach Earth. But once at Earth, they would discover that the Earth's level of technology was no match for the Cylons. Actors Kent McCord and Barry Van Dyke starred as Captain Troy and Lieutenant Dillon, respectively, and these characters were created basically to replace Apollo and Starbuck. The limited series, now called Galactica 1980, premiered on Sunday, January 27, 1980, airing from the 7 to 8 p.m. time slot opposite the wonderful world of Disney on NBC and the CBS juggernaut 60 Minutes. Even before that first broadcast, ABC had plans to offer Galactica 1980 as a weekly series in the fall of 1980, according to Marcy Carsey, one of ABC's vice presidents of programming at the time. Additionally, Galactica 1980 would see the members of the crew traveling back in time to alter Earth's past to better prepare the future to combat the Cylons. The premiere episode of the limited series ranked 31st for the week, while competitor 60 Minutes rose to second place. The second episode saw a drop again for Galactica 1980 as it dropped to 44th place, 
while 60 Minutes rose to first place. Despite the less than stellar ratings, ABC was satisfied enough with Galactica 1980's performance opposite 60 Minutes to order additional episodes in mid-February for broadcast after the Winter Olympics. The new episodes debuted on March 16th and almost immediately dropped to the bottom of the Nielsen charts. Not surprisingly, when ABC announced its 1980-81 schedule on April 28th, 1980, Galactica 1980 was nowhere to be found and it had been canceled. This time, there would be no questioning the cancellation. But the final episode of Galactica 1980, airing on May 4th, gave the fan base one last surprise to cheer about. The final broadcast saw Dirk Benedict reprise his role as Starbuck. For one of the original actors of Battlestar Galactica, the show must have had some deep-rooted meaning, as the late Richard Hatch, the actor who played Apollo in the original Battlestar Galactica, had attempted to revive the show in the late 1990s. But it's probably for the best that the audiences would just have to wait a few more years. The story written by Hatch and Sophia Laporte his girlfriend at the time, was titled Battlestar Galactica The Second Coming, and it was one of several Battlestar Galactica projects being developed towards the end of the 20th century. Along with the Hatch project, there was Ronald D. Moore's Battlestar Galactica reboot idea, along with ideas from filmmaker Brian Singer and original Battlestar Galactica creator Glenn A. Larson having separate movie proposals in development. Conceived as a pilot for an eventual TV show, Richard Hatch's second coming ignored the events of Galactica 1980 to pick up where the original show had left off. Hatch screened a rough-cut trailer of second coming for Battlestar Galactica fans at DragonCon in 1999, where it received some positive response. Hatch would continue to tour the trailer around sci-fi conventions, hoping that the positive fan response would translate into interest from Universal. Unfortunately for Hatch, the Battlestar Galactica revival went in a different direction. Although this different direction would eventually work out in Hatch's favor. Second Coming was about a more evolved version of the Cylon and a second Cylon War, an element not present in the original 1978 series. This project was funded by Hatch himself, without a major studio behind him. However, the script and the performances all felt out of step with the television themes of the 1990s. If Second Coming had been commissioned, it could be reasonable to speculate that it would have had the same fate as the short-lived Galactica 1980 series. Understandably, Richard Hatch's disappointment about Second Coming not being picked up led to some vocal objections by him regarding the Battlestar Galactica reboot, which was just a few years removed from his Second Coming proposal. So his wounds were still fairly fresh. However, Hatch's opinion quickly changed as he was the only original Battlestar actor who appeared in the 2004 reboot starting with Season 1, Episode 3, titled Bastille Day, as Hatch was cast as Tom Zarek, a political activist and former terrorist who played a role in some of Battlestar Galactica's most interesting storylines. Enter Ronald D. Moore's vision for a fresh take on the sci-fi classic. Ronald D. Moore is a writer and producer with a very distinguished science fiction background. Prior to Battlestar Galactica, he was the producer of several Star Trek series and films, as well as several other science fiction programs. Moore was recognized for his writing work 
on the Star Trek franchise with seven award nominations, winning two of them. In the post-Trek years, he greatly added to his list of credits, including the participation in the 2018 filming of the Star Trek Deep Space Nine documentary, What We Left Behind. While residing in Los Angeles as a struggling and budding writer, Ron Moore started to date a woman who worked on the set of Star Trek The Next Generation. In 1989, Moore, an avid fan of the Star Trek original series, convinced his girlfriend to take him on a tour of the Paramount lot. He had written a script for the show, which the producers liked enough to actually film. That script became Star Trek The Next Generation's Season 3, Episode 5, called The Bonding, and Moore was soon hired as a staff writer. He remained at that position until the end of the series. He co-wrote 27 episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, including the series finale, All Good Things, for which he won the Hugo Award for Excellence in Science Fiction Writing, along with Bron and Braga. Moore and Braga also co-wrote two films featuring the Next Generation cast, Star Trek Generations and Star Trek First Contact. As producer of The Next Generation in 1994, Moore shared an Emmy Award nomination when the series was nominated as Outstanding Drama Series that year. After The Next Generation ended in 1994, Moore joined the writing staff of Star Trek Deep Space Nine as a supervising producer, a post which he held from that show's third through fifth seasons until promoted in 1997 to co-executive producer. He is credited as writer or co-writer of 30 episodes of Deep Space Nine. In 1999, after Deep Space Nine finished its run, Moore briefly joined the staff of Star Trek Voyager and publicly suggested he might co-write with his one-time writing partner, Brandon Braga, who at this point was the producer for Star Trek Voyager. But Moore quickly became frustrated by the atmosphere in Voyager's writer's room and left the series after writing one episode and co-writing the story for another. Moore's love of Star Trek the original series showed itself through a myriad of ways in the episodes he worked on for The Next Generation in Deep Space Nine, such as the mention of the Tholians in Reunion and the first appearance of Starfleet Academy in The First Duty. And because of his fondness for the original series, he was chosen to write Relics, which featured Montgomery Scott and a holodeck duplicate of the bridge of the original USS Enterprise. According to Moore, his favorite original episode was The Conscience of the King, which inspired his first attempt at writing a Star Trek novel that would have told the story of Tarsus IV, the planet that was referred to in the Conscience of the King episode. Moore's hand in the Next Generation episode Sins of the Father gave him the nickname of The Klingon Guy and he went on to write nearly every Klingon-centric episode of The Next Generation in Deep Space Nine. After his run with the Star Trek franchise, Moore was approached by producer David Elk to partner up with him in the development of a revamped Galactica. Elk was charged by his employer Universal Studios for the project, but realized he needed help for the development by someone who had a thorough understanding of what made a science fiction show tick, and was aware that Emmy Award winning Moore was soon becoming available. Moore was not only a Trekkie, but he was also fond of the original Battlestar Galactica show and was willing and eager to lend his talents. Moore was given the co-executive producer position on the revamped franchise and basically becoming the equal to Elk. I was, I was very struck by the fact that at its heart um, was this very dark idea, this very dark premise of a show, that in the opening moments, you know, an entire civilization is lost, that your heroes are essentially the, the survivors who run away into the night, and that they are pursued relentlessly by their enemies, and they just have this hope of finding a place called Earth. And it was a really sort of like, you know, startling idea that that would be the premise of a science fiction television series. And when you watched that show, a few, very few months after 9-11,
you couldn't help but sort of draw the parallel and, and realize that if you made this show now, if you really presented this show truthfully and really sort of tried to take the premise seriously, people were going to bring to it their own experience. They were going to bring to the show their experiences, their memories, their feelings of what they were going through as people in the moment. And I realized, well, that's an amazing thing. You know, that's a gift. That's, that, that's a chance to do a, a show that means something and that has a certain amount of relevance to it. Following the 2003 two-part pilot miniseries, the reimagined Battlestar Galactica franchise ran for four seasons starting in 2004, and it was complemented by two Battlestar Galactica TV movies, Razor in 2007 and The Plan in 2009. Initially, the new Battlestar Galactica received accolades from fans of the original Battlestar Galactica movies and series, as well as media outlets, critics, and fans in both the U.S. and the U.K. Remarkable also was the backing of the reimagined series, as it received backing from original staffers and veteran actors like Richard Hatch, who, as mentioned, guest starred as a major character in, in several episodes. While creator and executive producer of the original series, Glenn A. Larson, served as a consulting producer for the entire run of the renewed franchise. Additionally, the series received a Peabody Award in 2006. Ron Moore won the 2005 Hugo Award for Best Dramatic Presentation Short Form for writing the first season's premiere episode, 33. It was the second Hugo Award that Moore had received to date following From All Good Things. Battlestar Galactica proved to be so successful that the second season was announced just as the second week's episode of the first season was being aired. The Sci-Fi Channel had even ordered advanced scripts for the first six episodes of the second season before it was officially renewed or had even aired in the United States. Battlestar Galactica's first season aired during the same time as Star Trek Enterprise's fourth season and Battlestar Galactica received higher ratings even though it was on a cable channel and Enterprise was on a broadcast network. Ronald D. Moore's reimagining of Battlestar Galactica emerged in the mid-2000s with several driving forces behind it, both creatively and commercially. In developing the series, Moore drew on post-9-11 anxieties of American life and security as well as his own frustrations with the limitations he'd experienced while working on the Star Trek franchise. For him, Battlestar was an opportunity to get rougher, more raw, and take the opera out of space opera. Looking back on the show today, 20 years after its debut, you can definitely see those themes and concerns arguably even more clearly than you could when the series premiered in 2004. Moore's vision of Battlestar Galactica is more realistic, often viewed as dark military science fiction, with a focus on the political, social, and psychological implications of prolonged war, the plight of refugees, and the constant balance between liberty and safety if such a balance could ever be achieved at all. Longtime fans of the series cite this sense of gripping realism embedded amid the Vipers and Cylon Centurions as one of the key reasons the show works so well. But realism is not the whole story, and neither is the lived-in feel of the show's design, the grounded character work, or the real-world parallels the series often drew from to tell the stories of the colonial fleet's constant battle for survival. Some fans grew disappointed when the show leaned away from the realism and into something more like magic realism, taking on a certain metaphysical sense of story logic to guide the series to its final resolution. But looking back, the sense of metaphysical weight was always part of Battlestar Galactica and was built so elaborately and completely into the show's final two seasons, making the series so much more compelling. 
So the metaphysical aspects of the series, they were on display in some form or another from the very beginning. From Gaius Baltar's continuous efforts to discern reality, from the various visions of Cylon Number 6, to the hidden Cylons and their reckoning with their own existence, to the very presence of a human Cylon hybrid child, Hera Agatha. But even with all of these elements in play throughout the series, nowhere in Battlestar's sense of magical thinking and philosophical power was felt more acutely than in the arc of Kara Starbuck Thrace, played by Katie Sackhoff. But more on Gaius Baltar and Kara Thrace in part two of our Battlestar Galactica then and now retrospective. And there you have it for now, Cosmic Core. We hope you have enjoyed part one of our Battlestar Galactica then and now retrospective. And I would like to thank all of you for subscribing and viewing and for your ongoing support. This channel belongs to all of us and we hope you get as much enjoyment out of watching our videos as we have making them. So don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and stay tuned. Part 2 of Battlestar Galactica Then and Now is coming soon. Have a great day, Cosmic Core.